ready? Why don't we all stand together and uh, come before our Father? Lord, we thank you for another chance to come into your house and, and to humble ourselves in your presence, to hear from your word. We want to rejoice, Lord, in, in who you are and what you've done. And that's why we're here. Tonight, we ask that you would bless each one, that you'd fill us with your spirit, your power, that you'd teach us your ways. We give ourselves to you, Lord. We pray in your name. Amen. We start off with praise him, praise him. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed redeemer, sing over. Archangels in glory, strength and honor, give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guide his children in his arms, he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, and tell us. Excellent grace, this praise Him, we praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer, for our sins He suffered, bled, and died. of eternal salvation. Bring him, 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 Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus for our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise him, praise him. Tell of his excellent grace, this praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer, heavenly portals, loud with those and the and priest and king Christ is coming over the world victorious power and glory unto the Lord belong praise him praise him tell of his excellent praise his praise Thank you, Lord. The good things he has done for us. Amen. Yes, yes. All right, take a minute and say hello, and uh, we'll be right back. What you deserve 
But still I come Because your cross is placed in me My word Oh Christ, my King of sympathy Whose wounds secure my peace Your grace extends to call me friend Your mercy sets Free. And I know I'm weak, I know I'm unworthy to call upon your name, but because of grace, because of your mercy, I stand here unashamed. I can't explain this kind of love I'm humbled and amazed That you'd come down from heaven's height And greet me face to face And I know I'm weak I know I'm unworthy to call upon your name but because of grace because of your mercy I stand here unashamed here I am at your feet in my brokenness complete here I am at your feet in my brokenness complete here I am at your feet in my brokenness complete upon your name but because of grace because of your mercy I stand here ashamed and I know I'm weak I know I'm unworthy to call upon your name but because of grace stand here on a shame but because of grace because of your mercy I stand here on a shame want to thank you tonight for your mercy, God, and your grace, and your love, Lord. It's true, Lord. We can approach you because of Jesus, who poured his grace upon us. And thank you, Lord God, that, Father, we can come into your presence, that you can love on us, and we can love on you, Lord God. It's a miraculous thing that, Father, we can have intimacy with the living God, but we can, Lord. And that's your heart and that's your desire. And you've put that in us, Lord God, so we thank you for that. We want to learn your thoughts, Lord, tonight. We want to learn your heart. So teach us, Lord God, through the Word of God. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. 
Amen. Please be seated. So if you brought your Bibles today, hopefully you all did. We're in the book of Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. So as you see, my wife's not here tonight. Have you noticed? She was being bad, so I <laughs> know. <laughs> She's in Kentucky. She's uh, visiting my granddaughter, our granddaughter, with our two oldest boys. And right now, she just sent me a video. I looked at it before I came up here. A video of a basketball game in the University of Kentucky. They're at the game. And she says, it's wild. They're screaming. I mean, they're a basketball, big basketball uh, school. So they're packed. And uh, she said, uh, the, the big screen TVs up on top, around the middle, they have one of those. And they uh, zoomed in on Jimmy, my oldest son, and my granddaughter, and she was, they were up there in the big screen. And I said to them, I don't know if they'll talk to me now that they're that popular. But they're back there having fun, enjoying themselves, and that's why she's not here. They're going to go to that Noah's Ark exhibit. That's all right, about 30 minutes away, so they're looking forward to doing that tomorrow, I think, tomorrow or Friday, then she's coming home Saturday. And when she comes back, I'm putting her to work. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Now, don't you guys all tell them I said this now. <laughs> okay, Proverbs chapter 8. Tonight we are going to again talk about this thing called wisdom. Wisdom is how to use knowledge rightly. And God tells us exactly what wisdom is and what will bring forth in the sense of his evidence of wisdom that's being effective and can be seen in each one of our lives by the choices we make. We've talked a lot about wisdom. So tonight I want to, and we will talk about it again, but I want to go to the book of James. Keep your hand where you are, because we're coming right back. James chapter 3. James is right after the book of Hebrews. Right before the Peters, first and second Peter. Chapter 3, verse 13. Since we know a lot about wisdom and we're going to learn more about wisdom, there's God's wisdom and there's other kinds of wisdom also. And we've all, sometime or another, have walked in this kind of wisdom. Let's read what it says in here in the book of James, chapter 3, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and you're self-seeking in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above, or from God, is first of all pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality and without hypocrisy. 
Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in the peace by those who make peace. So James teaches us and reminds us that there are three other kinds of wisdom besides God's. The first one he speaks about is a earthly wisdom. In other words, existence or exists on the earth. Today you see our world and you see the decisions they're making and honestly they think they're really wise. They're finding out that this COVID-19 did come from the COVID, come from the Wuhan lab. And in man's wisdom, and really in man's evil heart, he puts together something like this to destroy other men or to kill other men. So would you really consider that wisdom? Some of the wisest men and women probably in the world work on things like this, work on intelligent design. And there are some things that are beneficial, but there are many to destroy others or kill others. So would you consider that God's wisdom? No way. Would you think that would be wise? I wouldn't think it would be. I would think those doctors would be, our scientists were looking for how to cure diseases how to fix sicknesses, how to cure cancer. But instead, many of them are trying to get things that kill other men or destroy other men. And that always comes down to a thing called power. This is earthly wisdom that the Bible speaks of. Let's look at the second one, sensual wisdom. Corrupt desires and affections. These spring from the encourages or comes from them or from men. Men to seek immediately sensual desires, gratifications with any without any thought or of consequence. So what they th think is what sensual wisdom is, they just do things without thinking of the consequence or anything that's going to happen, the result of it. I just feel like doing this. This is what I feel like doing. It doesn't really matter. I don't care about the results. And we see that today in our world, that central wisdom, so to say, being used by many, many people. Let's look at this last one, demonic. Resembling our proceeding from an evil spirit, demonic-like. A good example would be Adam and Eve. Demonic wisdom. Demonic wisdom concerning the story of Adam and Eve questions God concerning motive. Question God's word. Did God really say that? You can be like God. And that's demonic wisdom. It has become very active in our nation. We are no longer a nation in the same way as we were 10 years ago concerning God. I believe that demonic wisdom is partly My brain is moving. Are part of the problem concerning evolution. I believe that what we see in our world today concerning transgenders, concerning homosexuality and lesbianism, and it's partly in the book of Romans chapter one also, but I believe that this is partly demonic questioning God and God's word and the truth of God's word. These are wisdoms that all of us have used sometime or another, been involved with. And now that we are Christians, 
Now God wants to give us wisdom. But we need to know that there are false wisdoms that come out. Now, let's start in the very first verse. It says, For wisdom cries out, and understanding lifts up her voice. She takes her stand on the top of high hills, besides the way where the path meets. She cries out in the gates at the entry of the city and the entrance of the doors. To you, O men, I call. And my voice is as the souls of men, or sons of men, I'm sorry. O oh, you simple ones, understand prudence, and you foolish are fools, be of an understanding heart. The first we see, we see Solomon writing, and he's writing, remember, to his son, and God is speaking to us at the same time. We are the children of God. Our Father writes to us. And it says, wisdom cries out. In other words, wisdom wants to reach everyone and therefore broadcast her message publicly. Wisdom words can be trusted. Now, notice who it cries out to, the simple. As you get older, I don't think you should be simple. But if you're a non-Christian, if somebody's a non-Christian, I think they stay simple in so many ways. This word simple literally means naive, foolish, childlike, or easily influenced. God desires for us to be childlike when it comes to faith. God wants us to trust him. But God doesn't want us to stay simple in this way. This word also means easily influenced or evil. I read a lot of articles concerning what's happening with our young people. Our young people are having some serious problems right now. And I believe because it's they're very simple, just what this word says, and they're very naive concerning many things. Some of our young people who have gone to Harvard, Yale, Many of the most prestigious colleges in the world today belong to Black Lives Matter, Antifa. They have a network where they can, on the internet, where they can have thousands and thousands of these young people in a matter of hours at a certain place or destination. And the sad part about it is they really think that what they're doing is exactly right. They're 100% right. And they're being deceived because they're totally naive and they're very simple. The people you see in masks, most of them, college degrees, rich families, these are all proven. And because of their naivety when it comes to the truth and what's real wisdom, this is what happens to their lives. God doesn't want us to be naive. God wants us to be wise. He speaks more about this in this verse called, it says, lift up your voice to understanding. The word literally means to be discreet, what to do and what not to do. When I first became a Christian, and I still do it today even, I want understanding. God wants to give me understanding. There's a lot of things going on in the world today that I just don't understand, but God does. He knows why they're happening. And they'll give me understanding and give you understanding. 
But when I first became a Christian, I wanted to even know more about what to do, what's right and what's wrong. I wanted that kind of understanding because I wanted my life to be blessed by God. And I knew what I knew already and what I experienced and all the seeds that I have sown, the way that I am, I was then, was not going to be a blessed life. But I knew that God wanted to bless my life. So I wanted to understand anything God wanted me to understand, how to be a good husband, how to be a good dad, how to be a good pastor, how to be whatever, a good brother or whatever, you fill in the blank. And then God began to show me through the Word of God and give me wisdom on how to apply the Word of God. And sometimes it would go against my ugly old flesh. As a matter of fact, a lot of times it went against, and I was, there was a battle going on in me on a regular basis. There still is somewhat. But God wants you to know, and He cries out on what to do and what not to do even how to do it. But I have to be open and willing to say, this has been the word for me this week, I surrender. I didn't say you surrender, I said I surrender. And that's for all of us. He goes on and he says, and you fools. Let me read you what the Hebrew word means for that. You stupid fellow. <laughs> you simpleton, you arrogant one. You Mr. Know-it-all. The Bible, and I've spoken about this before, from experience and from the Word of God. That it is so important that we keep our hearts in the place of we are humble and meek and lowly. Because then we can discern what God is telling us, whether it's true for of us or whether it's not true of us. I read the Bible every single day. I study almost every day. But my point is in saying that is this. I want to know what God is speaking in the sense of, is he speaking to me personally? I know I study a lot so I can teach you, but I have to learn myself. And God has to work in me and change me first. And so God tests it on me first. But if I'm a stupid, dull, simpleton, arrogant one, Mr. Know-it-all, I'm in trouble. Big trouble. So he offers this to this foolish. And then he speaks about being of an understanding heart. One that is distinguished. One that has insight. one who's willing to be taught. He goes on and he says this, listen, I will speak of excellent things. And from the opening of my mouth or my lips will come right things. So he says he's going to speak to them excellent, which means plain or evident to truth. Something that is of great honor. And from the opening of his lips, he's going to speak right things. That word means upright, straightness, smoothness, rightly. What I say is just and right. That's what that word means. If you ever have a question concerning the Word of God, whether it is the Word of God or whether it's all the Word of God, you're in trouble. Whenever we get selective when it comes to God's Word, we're in trouble. 
The Bible says that the word of God is unfallible, that it all contains God, what God says and what's on God's heart for us. And whenever I read the word of God, God speaks to me what is right and what is just, no matter what, always. I can always depend on God's word, and it is the only really solid pillar to build on today in our world, the truth of God's word. When I see something happening, God shows many times me many things that are happening, but I find out through the word of God more than that, or I'll listen to other teachers that are really good in prophecy or in the future or whatever they may be, and God will show me through them. But it's always in the word of God. Verse 7 says, For my mouth will speak truth, Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. The first thing he speaks about is he'll only speak truth. Divine instruction, the word means. True doctrine, reliability, stability. That's what that word truth means. And I want to read some scriptures to you with that same thought in mind thinking about meditating on the truth. Genesis 24, 48 says, And I bowed my head, and I worshiped the Lord, and I blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, who had led me in the way of truth to take the daughter of my master's brother for his son. Exodus 34, 6 says, And the Lord passed by before me and proclaimed, the Lord of lords, God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Psalms, I'm sorry, 2 Samuel 7, 28. And now, O Lord, God, you are God, and your words are true. And you have promised the goodness to your servant. 1 Samuel 2, 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth. And with all your heart, for consider the great things he has done for you. In Exodus 18, 21, Moreover, you shall select from you all the people able, to, able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness and placing such over them to be rulers of the thousands, rulers of hundreds and rulers of fifties, and the rulers of tens. So yes, it speaks here about for my mouth will speak truth, talking about wisdom. It will always be completely true, and God is always, always tells the truth. God can't lie. The second part of that verse says, wickedness is an abomination to my lips. It is the contrary, our moral, what's true and what's right. So it says here, wickedness is an abomination to my lips, false lips, or speaking falsehood, opposite of what is true. Wisdom is never, ever going to lie. It is never going to tell half-truths. It's to wisdom. People who lie or bring forth lies, it's an abomination to God. Verse 8, all my words of my mouth are with righteousness. Nothing crooked or perverse is in them. They are plain to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. So he speaks about this wisdom again, that all the words of my mouth are righteous, are just, are fair. And he uses this word speaks more of a being just in weights and measures also. So in other words, if you go to a court of law,
and the judge finds you guilty or not guilty, and it's a fair verdict, then that's justice. And it should be for everybody the same, no different. It's hard today to see some of the things that are happening in our courtrooms. It makes you not want to ever go to court for anything. Because if you stand for right, you don't know what the result can be for standing what's right. Because in our society today, right is wrong and wrong is right. But remember when God, what the book of Proverbs speaks to us and assures us that the judgment from a judge, our leader, is not in their hands, but it's in God's. I have to remind myself of that. Not that I have to go to court, but I just have to remind myself of that. He makes this statement, nothing crooked or perverse is in my, is in them. This word perverse means twisted or distorted or crooked or contradictory to this truth. They are plain to him who understands. They are straight, right in front. They bring a smooth path without stumbling and right to those who find knowledge. They are upright and fitting. Verse 10 says, and receive my instruction and not silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things one man may, con may desire cannot be compared to her. So the Bible teaches in this context tonight that wisdom, I'm sorry, receive my instruction and not silver. So it speaks about receiving the instruction greater than you would receive gold or silver. It's more important. And that word literally means it's to lay hold or seize or acquire or buy or even marry my instruction or my discipline, my chastening or my correction. That's what that word instruction means. So why does God, and I think we need to see the heart of God, be able to accept that the way God wants us to. So why does God discipline us and chasing us and correct us? When my children were growing up. I wanted to make sure that they had the best life that they could have in the future. I wanted to make sure that they were loved that they were taught the Bible and they were, the Bible was lived before them. So when they got out into the world, they would know how to deal with things God's way. And there were times I had to spank my, both my boys, the oldest boys and the youngest. I had to chasten them at times. I had to correct them at times. And I was even wrong at times, one time I remember specifically, when I did correct him and I had to spank him. My oldest son, Jimmy, was eight years old, I think he was, and he was throwing rocks outside, I thought. And he wasn't throwing rocks outside, but I didn't find out after that, found out that until after I had spanked him. So I, I was upset because they were throwing rocks, I thought. I saw my nephew with him standing there throwing rocks, I thought, and he was. My son wasn't. And so I took him in the room and said, yeah, you know what the result is, come on, I'm gonna get a spank, you're gonna spank him. But dad, but I said, no. I learned what not to do after that, concerning him with that. I prayed and we talked before we did that the next time. 
But I gave him a spanking, and I said, now, what do you want to say? I wasn't doing wrong, Dad. I said, okay. Did you want to spank me tonight? That's what I told him. He said, no, I don't want to spank you. My point is, the reason why God spanks us at times is because he loves us so much and he sees the destruction that sin causes and disobedience and rebellion. He sees all those things and he wants to get us out of it. He wants us to have a blessed life, a godly life, a life that prospers inside and outside, a heart that's not filled with guilt and condemnation. That's what God desires. So God allows these things to be. So we have to receive instruction from God. All the things one may desire cannot comp be compared to her. I wisdom, verse 12, dry dwell with prudence, and I find out knowledge and discretion. Prudence is defined as wisdom applied to practice. So wherever true wisdom is, and it will lead to an action. The fear of the Lord is the hate evil, pride and arrogance, and the evil way and the perverse mount I hate. So we see the effects of the fear of the Lord. It's to hate evil. Now I've heard people say to me, I don't really hate evil. Then I say to them this, then you don't really fear God. Part of fearing God is to hate things that are evil. Last night, I sat down. My wife's gone, so I thought, I'm going to sit down. And we had a class last night at my house, discipleship class. Afterwards, I sat down and I flicked on the television. I don't watch television hardly ever. So I flicked on the television, and there was Spartacus. I thought it was with uh, Kurt Douglas. I thought, no, that was part of it. I watched it for a few minutes. I'll just kind of doze off a little bit. And I'm watching it for about five minutes, and this old guy comes on there and starts cussing up a storm. And I'm thinking, oh, is this cringe me inside? And I said to God afterwards, I shut the TV off, I said, I'm so sorry. The Lord might have said something to me. He might have said to me, go to bed. <laughs> I'm saying that because I think he did say that before I turned that on. But I thought, no, I'll just watch a little bit of something, a little bit of something I wish I wouldn't have watched. But it may reminded me how the importance of fearing God. It says here that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. I don't think that we have a problem in the sense of believing that we hate evil. But I want you to remember what evil is. Evil is much more than just an evil, horrible person who murders somebody. That's evil. But this word means giving pain or causing unhappiness or misery to others. Are you having it? Evil will bring that to you, to your life or into your life. It means being unkind or hurtful or vicious in disposition. It means wicked ethically, in general, of persons, their thoughts, or deeds or actions. It means morally bad or wrong or harmful, injurious, sin. Well, I can not hate evil when I think I do by hurting other people, talking about them. That's the same thing. That's evil. I personally believe that we are to hate the same things God hates. If God hates these things that are evil, so should we. 
Now, I don't hate the people who do them. I hate what they do. And I believe the consequence, I hate the consequence of what happens because of the evil of someone that does something to a child. I hate the consequences. They'll be with that the rest of their lives. It's so sad. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures to you. Deuteronomy 12, 31. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abominations of the Lord which he hates, they have done to their gods. Or they burn even their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. Talk about evil. But you know what happened? God told them not to do this and to destroy everything in there. And down the road, they started offering their children in the fire too. God's people. They stopped hating. They stopped fearing God. They stopped hating evil. Let me read another scripture to you. This was Deuteronomy 16, 22. You shall not set up a sacred pillar which the Lord your God hates. God hates demonic idols. Now, Listen to what else God hates. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. I want to talk just a minute on pride. Let me share with you what it means. An unduly high opinion of oneself. Exaggerated self-esteem, conceit. Haughty behavior resulting from this. Arrogance. Delight or satisfaction in one's own or another's achievements and associations. The synonym pride refers either to a justified or an accessible belief in one's own worth, merit, superiority. Conceit always implies an exaggerated opinion of oneself or one's achievement. I like the song that Dan chose concerning, I know I'm unworthy to call upon your name, but because of grace. Now, there's always a consequence of pride. Let me read one to you. This is in 2 Samuel 17, 22, or 23, I'm sorry. And when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his donkey and arose. He got him home to his house, to his city, and he put his household in order and hanged himself, and he died and was buried in the sepulcher of his father. Hisophel was one of David's counselors. Absalom, David's son, rebelled against him and took over the kingdom in Jerusalem. And he stayed with Absalom, and then he began to speak to Absalom about what he needed to do. God sent another man, I think his name was Hiram, and he gave him the opposite counsel. And Absalom took his counsel, so he didn't take Hisophel's counsel. And so because of pride, Hisophel went and hung himself, that was pride, took his life, so to say. Let's look at another one. This is Second Corinthians, Second Kings chapter 5, 11 through 13. It says, But Naaman was wroth and went away, and he said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Now Abana and Farfar, the river of Damascus, are better than all the waters of Israel. May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and he went away in rage. His servants came near and spake unto him, and he said, My father, if the prophets had bid thee to do something great, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then, when he said these things, to wash and be clean? Naaman was a leader of the Syrian army. He was a great man. He caught leprosy. And he had heard from one of the servants' girls that they had taken from Israel that there was a, a, a prophet that could heal him in Israel. So he went there. And when he got there, he expected for him to come out with all this hoop and holler. And when the prophet Elijah told him, he said, go and wash in the river. And then he left. That's it. 
Or he says, forget you, I can't believe you said that. I wanted you to do it this way. And so his servant said to him, you know what, if he would have told you to do something great, you would have. Just go wash in the river, man. And he did, and he was completely healed of his leprosy. But his pride almost cost him his life because if he wouldn't have went and uh, dipped himself in the river, he wouldn't have been healed. He gave up his pride, thank God. There are many things that God wants to do in our hearts and in our lives, miraculous things. But a lot of the time, we have to humble ourselves before God and do what God says, the simple things. I have found as a Christian, there's nothing too low in what I need to do if God tells me to do it. You too, no matter what it is. If God says, I want you to go pick something up off, off the floor, you need to do it. If God says, go wash a toilet for somebody, you need to do it. God has blessings for you in mind. And because of not doing it, you lose the blessings. Now let's read what Abraham Lincoln wrote about pride. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in number, wealth, and power, and no other nation has ever been grown like us. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the progressive hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own, intoxicated with unbroken success. We have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of the Redeemer or the redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to God that made us. That's kind of a sad one, isn't it? No. I got my papers out of order. I'm trying to find my next page. There it is. Benjamin Franklin made this statement. There's perhaps no one of our natural passions so hard to subdue as pride. Beat it down and stifle it and mortify it as much as one pleases. It is still alive. Even if I could conceive that I had completely overcome it, I should probably be proud of my humility. Pride. Did you hear about the clever salesman who closed a hundred sales with this line? Let me show you something several of your neighbors said you couldn't afford. Now, let's look at pride's sister, arrogance. Full of our due unwarranted pride and self-importance, overbearing haughtiness. Now, before we go on and talk about arro arrogance, I want to make sure you understand this has nothing to do with your standing in God. We are children of God. We belong to God. God loves us unconditionally. We are saved by the grace of God. God has a special plan for us. But there are things that God wants to work in our heart, and that should not make us feel any less of ourselves in any way. I don't feel any less when God points out something he wants to work in my heart. I know I'm a special child. You're a special child. Every one of us are equal before God, loved by God. It, doesn't, it should never make you feel like, oh, boy, I'm a horrible person. That's not what God wants to do in any way. Convert, the word conviction, that's what the Holy Spirit does to Christians, only Christians. The word means to convince that what you're doing is harmful and hurting your life 
and God was trying to get you out of it. That's what conviction is. So please don't go to a place of, I'm such a horrible guy. That's not what God's saying in any way. Now, Isaiah 13, 11 says, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud and I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I want to read a story to you. This happened in 1969 in past Christian Mississippi. A group of people were preparing to have a hurricane party. In the face of the storm named Camille, are they ignorance of their danger? Could they have been overconfident? Did they let their egos and their pride influence their decision? We'll never know. What we do know is that the wind was howling outside the Posh Rush apartments when Police Chief Jerry Panella pulled up sometime after dark, facing the beach less than 250 feet from the surf. The apartments were directly in the line of danger. A man with a drink in his hand came out to the second floor balcony and waved. Paterno yelled up, you all need to clear out. Here's a quick, as, as quick as you can. The storm's getting worse. But as others joined the man on the balcony, they just slapped at Patera's order to leave. This is my land, one of them yelled back. If you want me off, you'll have to arrest me. Patella didn't arrest anyone, but he wasn't able to persuade them to leave either. He wrote down their names as the next of kin and the 20 or so people who gathered there to the party through the storm. They laughed at him as he took their names. They had been warned, but they had no intention of leaving. It was 10.15 p.m. when the front wall of the storm came ashore. Scientists clocked Camille's wind speeds at more than 205 miles per hour, the strongest on record. Raindrops hit with the force of bullets and waves of the Gulf Coast crested between 22 and 32 or 38 feet high. News reports later showed that the worst damage came at the little settlement of motel, go-go bar, and gambling house known as Past Christian Mission, Mississippi, which some 20 people were killed at the hurricane party in Rochelle Apartments. Nothing was left of this three-story structure but the foundation, and the only survivor, five, survivor was a five-year-old boy clinging to a mattress that followed that day. So God hates arrogance, and arrogance comes in different forms. God hates evil, the evil way, or the way that people live that is evil. God hates the perverse mouth. Let me read the word to you in the Hebrew. Stubborn or willful, con uncontrolled, not easily controlled, obstinate or disobedient, difficult or contrariness. It was somebody who's always adverse. You say something and they say the opposite. Proverbs 16, 28 says, A perverse man sows strife, and a whisper of separates the best of friends. Talking about the same thing, a perverse mouth. Let me read a story to you. It's called the story of four bulls. Adolf tells us that there were four bulls which were great friends. They went everywhere together. They laid down and rest together, always keeping so close to each other that if any danger were near, they could all face it at once. And there was a lion which had determined to have them, but he could never get them singly. He was a match for any one, but not for all four. However, he used to watch for his opportunity, and when one lagged the least bit behind the others as they grazed, he would slink up and whisper as the other bulls had been saying unkind things about him. This he did so often that at last the four friends became uneasy, even thought the other three were plotting against him. 
Finally, as there was no trust among them, they went out by themselves. Their friendship was broken. That was what the lion wanted. One by one, he killed them, and it made four good meals for the lion. <laughs> That's kind of a funny story, and I'm sure it's not true, but in life, these same things can happen. We need to be careful. And what we say to others, Proverbs 10.31 says, The mouth of the righteous brings forth wisdom, but the perverse tongue will be cut out. Now, verse 14. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength by me kings reign and rulers just. Decree justice. So, counsel belongs to wisdom. Advice, good advice. It makes you strong when you do know what you need to know, and then you live it, you apply it to your life. It says kings and rulers rule, they gain power and stay in power by using wisdom. By me, princes, rules, and nobles, all the judges of the earth, I love those who love me, and those who love me, seek me diligently, will, diligently will find me. So first of all, he speaks about loving wisdom. He speaks about speaking or seeking it diligently to find it. It's not always easy to find the answer. We can go on the internet and we can find almost anything we want concerning answers. But remember where they are. Demonic, sensual, and earthly. That's what the, wor the, the world brings them. But God's is totally different. In order to find out wisdom, you have to diligently seek it. You have to do some work, sweat. It's kind of like going out and cutting the tree down and cutting the wood and then splitting it and then stacking it and then taking it home and stacking it at home. It's a lot of work, isn't it? It's the same thing in finding wisdom. But the Bible makes a promise, if you will seek it, it will be found. Verse 18, riches and honor are with me. Enduring riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yes, and fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. If you treasure wisdom more than gold and silver and rubies, you'll find that the result will be better than gold and silver. As you get older, you begin to realize things are not so important as much as they used to. Possessions aren't so important. Probably what's more important than anything else is that relationship with God where God brings in that peace that surpasses understanding and that rest that love that God wants within us. You can have a thousand dollars in your pocket and be one of the most miserable, unhappy, unpleasant people in the world. It's not about what you have and what you accumulate. It's who you have and what he gives you in the sense of peace and joy and love. And wisdom will bring that. Verse 20, I traverse the way of righteousness in the midst of the path of justice, that I may cause those who love me to inherit wealth, and that I may fill their treasuries. In other words, God says he will prosper you as you use his wisdom. Now, we're going to rush through this. We're almost done. Verse 22, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way. He begins to speak about God creating and what he did in, in creation. Before his words of old, I have been established from everlasting. From the beginning, before there was earth ever an earth, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there was no fountains above or abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth or the fields or the primal dust of the world, 
When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limits, that the waters would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundation of the earth, so that God used wisdom and intelligence in the design of the universe. God used wisdom to make something out of nothing. All the things you see on earth, the sea that stops, uh, the ocean that stops at the sand, God did that on purpose. God made all that. We didn't evolve, I promise, that way. God created everything you see, and he used wisdom to do that. And we have a beautiful world. We really do in so many ways. There's so many beautiful places, places. But imagine what it was like before this Adam sinned. It was so much more beautiful than it is right now. Verse 30, then I was, I was beside him as a master craftsman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his inhabited world. And my delight was with the sons of men. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children, for blessed are those who keep my way. Hear instruction and be wise, and do not disdain it. Blessed is the man who listens to me. So we see two words, listen, Blessed and blessed again is the man who listens to me and watches daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors. Whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who sins against me wrong, he wrongs his soul, his own soul. And all those who hate me hate death. So he tells them to please listen and do not disdain what I'm going to tell you. So how teachable are you before we end? Howard Hendricks shares this insight about the value of learning. He says, when I was a college student, I worked in the college dining hall, and on my way to work at 5.30 every morning, I walked past the home of the one of my professors. Through a window, I would see the light at his desk on, morning after morning. At night, I stayed late at the library to take an advantage of evening study hours, and I returned home at 10.30 or 11 o'clock, and I would again see his desk light on. He was always poring over his books. One day, he invited me home for lunch, and after the meal, I said to him, would you mind if I ask you a question? Of course not. What keeps you studying? You never seem to stop. His answer, Son, I'd rather have my students drink from a running stream than a stagnant pool. God is always in the business of teaching us. And the water that he gives us are living waters. And the word that he gives us is living. And we need to have the fresh word of God every day. God doesn't want you to have leftovers. He wants you to have fresh. Notice what it says here. He who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. When you apply God's word to your life, it brings God's life to you. But he who sins against me, against wisdom that God brings, he wrongs his own soul. He who hates me loves death. So in this part of this chapter, it calls everyone to listen. Wisdom offers blessings and life to those who heed her, but cursing and death to those who hate her. Wisdom's gracious invitation is more desirable than anything and an invitation to a blessed life. Father, we are grateful for the word of God tonight, Lord God. And Lord, we have all gained wisdom since we've known you. As we've studied your word, God, and you give us counsel. 
And Father, you've worked many things in our heart. You've revealed things to us, Lord God. And we thank you for that, Lord God. But tonight, Lord, we cry for your wisdom more and more every day. And give us a heart to search for it, God. You desire to reveal it, Lord. But sometimes it takes a little bit of elbow grease, Lord. So I pray that you'd put that in our heart, that we would, Father, want that wisdom. And Lord, there are some things, Lord God, that prayer brings wisdom, Lord. You say in the book of James, anyone who lacks wisdom to pray. So, Father, if there's a decision or someone has to make some decision that's important in their life, Lord, and it's not, Father, Scripture in the sense of they can't find the Scripture, Lord, reveal, Lord, your wisdom to them and what you would have them to do or not do, Lord God, or you would have them to go or not go, Lord God. And may they surrender to whatever you desire, whatever is on your heart concerning them and your great love for them, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen.